ethical hacking has become a lucrative industry for cybersecurity professionals and enthusiasts. With the major task of an ethical hacker running on command line tools, learning a scripting language like Python is highly essential. Python has grown in popularity thanks to various applications in multiple sectors while being a relatively easy to learn language. Discovering the benefits of Python's in ethical hacking helps beginners write their own customized scripts at the time of penetration testing. Hey everyone, welcome to this video on ethical hacking using Python. Let's take a look at the topics we are covering today. We start by learning about ethical hacking and how useful they are for organizations looking to secure their systems against malicious hackers. We cover the basics of the Python programming language as well. Next. We take a look at the distinct advantages of Python over other programming languages when it comes to user friendliness. Finally, we write two programs from scratch which help ethical hackers in cracking passwords. Let's start by learning about ethical hacking in general. When we talk about penetration testing or ethical hacking, we mean hacking that is based on ethical or moral principles and has no harmful intent. Ethical hacking is defined as any type of hacking that has been allowed by the owner of the target system. It might also refer to the practice of putting in place active security measures to safeguard system from malicious hackers. It is the process of subverting or cracking a system security in order to find vulnerabilities, data breaches and potential threats. It is only regarded as ethical if regional or organizational cyber laws are followed. This is known as penetration testing in the technical world. The strategy, as the name indicates, comprises seeking to enter the system and documenting the purposes necessary. The purpose of ethical hacking is to improve the security of the network or systems by fixing the vulnerabilities found during testing. Ethical hackers may use the same methods and tools used by the malicious hackers, but with the permission of the authorized person for the purpose of improving the security and defending the systems from attacks by malicious users. Ethical hackers are expected to report all the vulnerabilities and weaknesses found during the process to the management. Ethical hacking has proven itself to be quite a productive career option for many ambitious individuals. The demand for its courses today is at an all-time high and rightfully so. It provides you with an engaging job that never gets tedious. Some certifications like the CompTIA+, CEH and Cisco CCNA are highly acclaimed and will teach a learner all there is to know before dipping their toes in the industry. To summarize, an ethical hacker acquires access to a target system before any criminal hacker. This allows the organization's security personnel to deliver a security patch to the system, thereby closing a gap for an attacker to enter the system or perform a hack. Now that we understand the basis of ethical hackers, Let's go over how Python came into existence and its features. Python is a computer programming language often used to build websites and software. It can also be used to automate tasks and conduct data analysis. Python is a general purpose language, meaning it can be used to create a variety of different programs and isn't specialized for any specific problem. This versatility along with its beginner friendliness has made it one of the most used programming languages today. A survey conducted by industry analyst firm Redmonk found that it was the most popular programming languages among developers in 2020. Python is commonly used for developing websites and software, task automation, data analysis and data visualization. Since it's relatively easy to learn, Python has been adopted by many non-programmers such as accountants and scientists for a variety of everyday tasks like organizing finances. It has become a staple in data science, allowing data analysts and other professionals to use the language to conduct complex statistical calculations, creating data visualizations, build machine learning algorithms, manipulate and analyze data, and complete other data-related tasks. Python, however, is mostly used to create scripts rather than full-scale programs. A Python script, the file containing the commands, is structured to be executed like a program. These files are designed to contain various functions and import various modules. Python interactive shell or the respective command line is used to execute the script to perform a specific task. A script is structured by defining the set of function definitions and then stating the main program used to call the functions. A program consists of numerous tasks. These tasks can be executed with the help of scripts. Unlike libraries, 
scripts can be used without importing and are less code intensive. Python variable assignment is different from some of the popular languages. There is no declaration of a variable, just an assignment statement. When we declare a variable in C or C++ or any other R-like languages, this sets aside an area of memory for holding values allotted by the data type of the variable. The memory allocated will be interpreted as the data type suggests. At compile time, initial value will be checked. So we cannot mix the data types in between. But Python is a dynamically typed language. It doesn't know about the type of the variable until the code is run. So the declaration is of no use. What it does is, it stores that value at some memory location and then binds the variable name to that memory container. This makes the contents of the container accessible through that variable name. So the data type does not matter. It will get to know the type of the value during runtime. Python also offers multiple options for developing GUI or graphical user interface. Out of all the GUI methods, tkinter is the most commonly used method. It is a standard Python interface to the TKGUI toolkit shipped with Python. Python with tkinter is the fastest and easiest way to create GUI applications. Python programming languages is widely used by companies around the world to build web apps, analyze data, automate operations via DevOps, and create reliable, scalable enterprise applications. Many companies do not even realize they are using Python across their organizations. For example, if a company is a Java-only company, but they use IBM FSphere as a web application server, then they have to use Python to script the server's configuration. Python has a habit of getting in everywhere regardless of whether the usage is intentional. Big names like Microsoft, Netflix, Google, Uber, and Dropbox regularly use Python in their software framework development. Now that we understand Python's basic functionality, let's cover some of its advantages when compared to industry counterparts. When it comes to third-party modules, the Python Package Index, also known as PYPI, contains several third-party modules that allow Python to communicate with the majority of other languages and systems. It has functions that are separate to the Python code base and has many extra capabilities that can be activated later on. Python also contains a vast standard library that covers topics such as string operations, internet protocols, web services tools, and OSI interfaces. Many joint programming tasks have already been coded into the standard library, considerably reducing the amount of code that a new developer must write. Python is open source due to a lack of official technical support, which has driven the establishment of communities that increase the resource bank for the language's continuing growth and acceptance. Its source code development is partnered with multiple coders and receives community feedback well. Features are often shared with the community to garner feedback before pushing them onto the main branch. Python includes built-in data structures such as lists and dictionaries that may be used to create quick runtime data structures. Furthermore, Python has added benefit of dynamic high-level data typing, decreasing the support code length required. Data structures are the set of data elements that produce a well-organized way of storing and organizing the data in the computer so that it can be useful. For example, the data structures like stack, queue, linked list, etc. are mostly used in the field of computer science, artificial intelligence, and graphics, etc. We have now covered all the features Python offers and the basic functionalities. Let's write some real-time Python code that can crack passwords using Python's libraries. In this demo, we will write two blocks of code, both of which offer a unique way to break passwords. The first one is a brute force attack, the other is a dictionary attack. The difference with brute force attack is that in brute force, a large number of possible key permutations are checked, whereas in the dictionary attack, only the words with the most possibilities of success are checked and are less time consuming than brute force. So let's jump into the code editor now. The code editor we are using today is PyCharm. PyCharm serves as an IDE for running Python programs specifically and can be downloaded for free as a community edition. Now, the first thing we're going to start is by importing some libraries. The first one would be the random library. This one would be necessary to generate the random choices from which the password will be guessed. Next, we're going to import another library, 
known as P Y auto G Y. This is necessary to generate a graphical user interface where the user will be asked to enter the password to be cracked. Next, we're going to create a variable called as cares. This will hold the number of characters. It will store all the characters which can be used in our password. So we're going to start with all the alphabets. And just to be safe, we're going to add all the digits as well from 0 to 9. Now this can be expanded further to include special characters, but we're going to skip that for this example. Next, we're going to turn this variable into a list. This is necessary so that we can traverse the list accordingly. So we're going to create a new variable all care and convert this into a list. And there we go. Regarding the user, they are asked to enter a password that needs to be cracked. The password will be entered into a graphical user interface and can be stored in a variable. Let's take it as pwd. We're going to use the pyautogui function to generate the GUI. The type of input will be a password input so that the values entered are not visible. We're going to write a message such as enter a password. And that's it. Let's skip the semicolon over here. The user will see this message on the graphical user interface and can then enter a password. Now the passwords that are being guessed need to be stored somewhere. So we're going to create a sample PWD password and just enter a null value to go with. Now we're going to start generating random values that need to be checked. For that we're going to use a while loop and the condition that we're going to run is sample password which will be our guest password should not be equal to PWD which is the original password. Now this loop will run as long as the values are not same. The moment the sample password which is a password guessed and generated randomly becomes equal to the original password, this loop will be closed and the program will be over. So we're going to start generating by assigning the value to sample pwd is equal to going to use the random.choices function and the arguments we're going to pass as all cap which is the list of all the values that need to be checked or more like all the characters that can be used to generate random choices and for the length we're going to assign a value of k which will be the length of the original password. The original password which is entered we're going to check the length using the len function and make sure that the random choices function generates passwords of that length specifically. Now we can skip this so that it checks for all the possible variations and all the different lengths but that will take time so we're going to stick with something small for this example. Next we're going to print out a message where we can see the number of values that are being checked. We can put up a simple message such as this. We're going to check the string value of sample pwd and we're going to close the message. That's it. Now, this is the one that generates the random choices. We also have to check the choices with the original password. So we're going to set up an if condition over here and we're going to write if sample pwd is the same as pwd or we have to use the list version of pwd since sample pwd in itself will be a list. If it is true, we're going to print the password is we're going to put up a space and we're going to join the new one. Okay. 
this will display the guest password. We can break over here so that we run out of the if condition and the loop. Now let's run this code once. To run main. Okay, as you can see, we have missed a colon sign over here in the while function. So we're going to run it now. As you can see, we have the GUI that is asking the password for us. Now we can give a small password so that we can see if it's working or not. We're going to write PC2. And since we have given the data being input as dot password, it's not going to show what is being entered over here. I have entered the password of ABC1. So press OK. And you can see it's going to check the combinations of four digit passwords. Now this doesn't follow a specific order. So this works on generating random choices. We can create programs that goes a specific order as a single permutation like we're going to start from 000 and move on to 0001. That's typically how normally brute force password crackers work. But this is easier to examine and we can see how the program is being worked on using this. Now if we're going to stop it for now and give it another try going to run main I'm going to try something else and you can see it keeps running up the same program and this time I entered the password of ABC2 and you can see in one of those random choices it did find out my password like I said we can do this using a systematic method where it goes from the first option to the very last one but this is more easier to explain and more easier to visualize as a first program now regarding our next program which is going to be a dictionary attack. A dictionary attack uses a word list. A word list will, will have a list of passwords that can be used or a list of possible outcomes. We're going to start by importing some libraries on its own. Here, we need to use only import hashlib because the password that we're going to enter will be a hashed version. We're not going to give the plain text password in an input like we did in the previous program. So to work on those hash and the functions that are necessary to work on those hashes, we're going to use this library. We're also going to set up a counter of pass found. This is necessary to know if the password has been found or not. When we do find the right password, we can change the value of this counter and the program and the interpreter will know that our program has been completed. The password that the user will enter needs to be in a hash format. So we're going to keep it in a variable known as, let's say, i hash. We're going to ask the user for the input, enter the hashed password. And there we go. Next, we're going to use the word list over here. To use the word list, we need to open it. How can we do that? Let's take up a variable known as pdoc. We're going to ask the user for an input. Going to move on to the next line using the backslash n command and write enter password file name including path. So what we are asking over here is we're going to ask the user for a particular path in the local system where the file has been opened up. Once the user gives the file name path, we can open it and store it in a file. Let's say p file, and we're going to use the file option functionalities of Python. Okay, functionalities of Python. We're going to use the path stored in p doc, and open in read mode only. Next, we're going to set up our loop, which is going to check every single password with the hashed password. We're going to use a for loop. We're going to carry out every word in the open file over here. Next, as we know, we have received a hashed value of the password. We need to convert it into standard terms before we can start comparing. First, what we have to do is we have to encode the hashed password into a common variable known as the UTF-8 standard. 
Now there's a good chance that it is by default in UTF-8 encoding, but the running this line helps us in being sure that the next few lines work correctly. We're going to store another variable known as hash word. This is after the encoding where we're going to use another hashlib function which is the md5 so that we can convert the value found in enc word and keep it in a hashed format now that we have made it clear that we now the hash can be read and run by the computer we're going to get the final hash digest of it now to strip the hash digest we're going to store it in a value let's say of name digest we use the value generated above in hash word and write hex digest this will generate the hash digest of the password and create, store it in this digest variable now we have the digest so we can start comparing it to the password file that we have found we're going to write a loop such as if digest is equal to the input hash which is the hashed password that the user input then we can just print password found which we can then show using whatever value has been extracted right now from the password file or the word list we're also going to change the variable of the pass found counter to 1 and we're going to break now let's say that we do not find a password we have to um, inform the user that the password is not found in the particular word list so we're going to write another loop let's say if not pass found now think of it from a uh, systematic way the default value of pass found is zero let's say we do find a password in the word list the value is getting changed to one so at this point of time the value of pass found should be one if the password has been found if not one which basically implies if zero since one is considered as true and zero is considered as false if it is one this part of the if condition will not be executed this part will only be executed if no password is found and by default the value of pass found is zero so if not zero we'll turn it to if one which is supposed to be true and the following lines will be executed so the next few lines we're going to print that the password was not found and we can start running the program now to generate the hashed password we're going to use an online tool known as the md5hashgenerator.com now let's say our user password is the same as the one we used in the last program which is abc2 we're going to generate the hash we're going to copy the md5 hash over here we press on copy and we're going to paste control v and press enter now this password file name is asking for the location of the word list now i have stored the word list in my d drive with the name of p1.txt this file has a list of passwords which also include the word abc2 in there so we're going to press enter as you can see it has found the password abc2 after doing the hash functionalities over here now if we were to remove it let's say we're going to use a wrong password for example we're going to create a new value such as of abc5 and take this new hash value we're going to rerun this program and we're going to use a new hash value which is not present in the current word list As you can see, we are now getting the expected password not found functionality. So this way, the password has been cracked open with two different types of attacks using a brute force and a dictionary attack.
Since this type of methodology works on a word list, this is known as a dictionary attack as it has a source of passwords where it can check the possible outcomes from. Hope you learned something new today. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask us in the comment section and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Subscribe to our channel for more informative videos like this and thank you for watching. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.